All right. Hey, everybody. My name's Cassie. Uh, the title of my talk is Surviving and Thriving in the Panopticon, Maintaining Privacy in the Workplace as a Chronically Ill Activist. If you can't tell, I took a lot of uh, cultural studies classes in college and like to have fun names like that. So first, I'm going to talk a little bit about myself. Um, who am I? My name is Cassie, and I have had Crohn's disease for about 10 years now, um, since I was 16. And for about the first three years of that, it was pretty uncontrolled. Um, my pharmaceutical drugs didn't really work. And I was found cannabis really helped, and I've been in remission for about seven years thanks to that. And um, unfortunately, I would just say that remission for me is not really like sunshine and rainbows. And um, I still do have a lot of pretty significant daily symptoms um, just because of the damage that was done to my intestines in those three years that it wasn't super well controlled. Um, because of that, I am a cannabis activist. I was pretty instrumental in getting the medical cannabis law passed here in Minnesota. Um, there are lots of problems with that. If you want to talk to me afterwards, I'm happy to rant about it. Um, and I'm also a privacy and encryption activist. I co-founded Crypto Party MN, and we teach folks here in the Twin Cities how to encrypt their personal communications um, in a fun, kind of laid-back setting. And so those are just a few reasons why I care about privacy. Um, and I'm sure that you guys all have your own reasons for caring about privacy. Everybody's pretty individual in that. Um, and then, so we're going to talk about what is the panopticon, because that's kind of a weird term. And <laughs> it's basically an idea that was created by Jeremy Bentham in the late 18th century. And it was popularized further in the 1970s by Michel Foucault. And basically the idea is that you should be able to maintain some sort of surveillance over an entire population, whether that is hospitals, schools, um, prisons. Bentham really focused a lot on the prison system. And most of what you'll see in discussions about the Panopticon is the Panopticon prison. And what that is, is it's a circular setup with cells all around. And there's a giant tower in the middle. And the guards are in the tower. And the inmates are unable to know when they're being watched and when they are not being watched. And so it creates this chilling effect where because you're never quite sure when you're being watched, you alter your behavior accordingly and decide you should probably act better, just generally. And so I really believe that Bentham couldn't have ever, ever fathomed the sort of panopticon we have today with surveillance and technology and just the pure breadth of how you can be surveilled and how you can be watched in your everyday life. But I really believe he'd be thrilled, honestly. Um, because some of what he said about the panopticon was things like it was, quote, a mill for grinding rogues honest. Or, um, I'm paraphrasing here, but basically it was a way to have power over mind in a quantity that was unfathomable up until that point. And technology has just blasted that off into a way that we really can't even imagine. And so one way, and I talked about the chilling effect a little bit, and one way that we're starting to see studies now about people who are surveilled, and we know that we're surveilled in our everyday lives. Edward Snowden brought out all the NSA papers, and we, we had this idea before, right? But now we've had it confirmed. And there was a recent New York Times article where they were discussing children and how they act when their parents are taking photos of them because they know that their parents are oftentimes putting things on social media without their consent, and they're portraying them in a way that the children don't like. And so what these kids are doing now is they're actually physically turning away in photos. If the you know, parent didn't say, I'm not going to put this on Instagram, I'm not going to put this on Twitter. 
um, I'm not going to do these things. If the child isn't getting that reassurance and they don't have control over their own narrative, they're actually physically altering their behavior in a way that they gain that control back. And that's the sort of thing we see when you realize, and children are realizing very early, that everything online is permanent at this point. There's nothing really ephemeral. If you're not taking steps to ensure your privacy while you're online, you're really not having the ability to grow and to kind of develop thoughts and all of these things that we've been able to do as a society. And we've been able to fail and learn and all these things that you aren't able to do when you're surveilled constantly. And so we're gonna talk about what is privacy. I kind of alluded to it a little bit earlier saying that it's really about what you choose um, to reveal. And what I would kind of reiterate is that it's really about the agency, right? So when I go into job interviews, I don't say that I have Crohn's disease. Um, it's not really a possibility to keep it secret at this point. I'm pretty public about it. But <laughs> a few years ago, I was keeping it fairly secret because it's something that you don't want an employer necessarily to know. Yes, I have a chronic illness. I'm probably going to be sick a fair amount. And, but I can do the job. Please just let me do the job. And it's really hard to fight that fight if you're being forced to have these things out in the open. And so one other talk that I saw that I thought was really interesting was by a guy named Aral Balkin. And he had everyone in the room stand up and he asked questions and said, you know, would you allow, or would you put your phone number online? Would you allow photos of yourself online? Would you allow your address to be online? And people sat down as they decided that wasn't things that they wanted online. But there were a handful of people at the end who said that they would hand out photos, email addresses, addresses, phone numbers of not just themselves, but their friends and family. And that, Aral said, don't be friends with those people. Look around and don't be friends with those people. And I want to reiterate that, don't be friends with people like that, but also don't be that person. Don't put things out that you don't know if that person wants it out in public or not. And that this conference is really good about consent, right? It's all about consent, and we want to have the agency to choose what we reveal and what we don't. So some of the work policies it's a mixed bag. I work for a really large corporation, and we have some really great um, policies for privacy at work, and we have some not so great um, policies for privacy at work. So I'm going to talk about some of the positive policies first, and then we'll go through some of the negative ones. So one of the things that I really love about my job is I have a flexible schedule. So someone with a chronic illness, I can't always make it to work right at eight or right at nine. Having that flexibility to be able to come in and leave when I've done my job, that's really important to me. We also have a flexible work from home schedule. So for me, privacy includes being able to be sick and not be in a really public place when that's happening, right? So I need to go to the bathroom a lot when I'm not feeling well. I don't generally want to be in a place where my coworkers are coming in and out. If I'm able to work from home, I have that ability to be at home, be comfortable, and still get my work done. Secondly, we don't drug test anybody at my company. And so for someone who, when I originally got the job, uh, it was illegal to be using cannabis medicinally. Uh, that was a huge thing for me. I was very wary about what companies I was interviewing for who I could work for, et cetera. Thankfully, that's changed now with the law. I have some protections with drug testing. But really, I believe that you shouldn't be drug testing your employees anyway, right? Unless they're in a position where it's a safety thing. But when we're talking about technology, generally speaking, nobody's in a position where you're going to harm somebody's life in a really detrimental way um, if you are using drugs on your own time. 
So I really believe that drug testing in general should be kind of put on the back burner. And then finally, we do have admin access on all of our laptops at work. So I'm able to install whatever I want. I install Tor Messenger, Tor Browser, Privacy Badger, all of these things that maintain my privacy to some degree while I'm on my work laptop, which is unfortunately extremely surveilled, which I will talk about now. Um, so one of the more negative policies at work is that we have a couple pretty uh, large reaching surveillance uh, programs basically at work under the guise, one is under the guise of protecting data that is proprietary to the company. I think we all understand that you need to do that to some level, but what my company is doing is <coughs> openly letting us know that anything we do on our laptops, personal email, Facebook, Twitter, all of that, that data is being kept. They say that they're deleting it when they figure out that it's not pertinent. I don't trust a whole lot of that. Um, so it's being kept on a server in Chicago somewhere. Um, and so when you're talking about people who are marginalized, oftentimes don't have as much money coming into this industry, when you're telling them, all right, you get this laptop, and you probably may not be, afford, be able to afford a second laptop to do your personal business on, but here's this laptop, and you're gonna be surveilled, everything that you do on it. And so what is the choice as a marginalized person? Are you choosing to enter into this so that you can get some level of financial stability and maybe expand your career? Or are you choosing not to enter into those surveillance programs? And that's a really difficult choice for a lot of people. And I struggle with it personally um, a lot at my work about what I'm comfortable with and what I'm not comfortable with. And one of the other policies that we have we just recently went into place is we're giving away fitness trackers to everyone for free if you want to participate in the wellness program for our health insurance, which gets you a discount on your health insurance. So if you want to get this discount, you're supposed to be going to the gym so often, doing so many things, and their argument is, well, now we can, we can verify you actually did that. But the flip side is you're also giving away everything that that Fitbit tracks, which is a whole lot more than just your steps or if you went to the gym at a certain time or anything like that. And you're giving away all of that data for a discount. And unfortunately, some people don't have a choice and they really, really need that discount. I'm choosing not to because I fortunately don't have to. But, you know, some people are in a position where they don't have that choice. And so what can we do as employees? And when we're working at companies that are doing things like this, um, first, I, like I said, I install Tor browser on my laptop. At least I can mask some of my internet traffic from my employer. But one of the complications with that is a lot of companies actually block Tor traffic because it gets a lot of bad rap from press, dark web, ah, uh, scary. Um, drugs are there and stuff. But what people don't realize is that it's really used as a privacy mechanism for a lot of people. And when I'm doing browsing at work, I prefer to do that. But what's been tricky is uh, my employer's networking team is starting to figure out that I'm using Tor. And on certain data centers, they're shutting down Tor access. So I'm slowly losing servers that I can use to get on Tor. And I'll have to start using bridges and all of these sorts of things. But you can use Tor. Another thing that I do is I do a lot of browsing on my phone instead of on my laptop. Um, I'm lucky enough to have an unlimited data plan, so I don't really have to worry about that. And I just go on Twitter on my phone. And I feel somewhat more secure with Sprint having my data than my company, which is a little twisted and 
doesn't really make sense, but you have to make those decisions. Um, so you can also, if you're a position, in a position where you're able to be making policies or advocating for policies in your work, really be thinking about people who are chronically ill, people who are marginalized in various ways, and how they want to maintain their privacy. And you may not know that some of these people are trying to maintain their privacy in various ways, because honestly, my illness is pretty invisible a lot of the time. And so it's not very obvious, and you're not going to know, but you can really push the envelope by allowing TOR if you're a cis admin. Um, advocating for not surveilling your laptops at every moment of the usage, things like that, that you can really, you can make a difference that way. Or when you're first getting a job offer, right, you actually have a lot of power in that moment when they want to hire you and they've spent a lot of time getting you interviewed, et cetera. Ask them, what, what are you gonna do for me to ensure my privacy. Can I work from home? Can I use Tor on my laptop? What sorts of surveillance programs are you using? I don't know if you want to say surveillance programs to your potential employer, because it sounds a little uh, like you're trying to poke them or something. But you know, figure out a way to ask about those things before you enter into a position so you know what you're getting into. And I think that is about it, unless people have questions. Two sort of related comments on uh, browsing from your phone mm -hmm. is, do you have enough, does Tor work from a phone reliably or is it slowed things down too much for user experience to be useful? And then uh, comments about VPN use, um, are, there, are there any that are affordable? Yeah, um, so the first question, uh, Android is far better for Tor usage. Uh, there is Orbot and, um, I think Orbot is the main one that routes your traffic through Tor um, as a whole on your phone. And then there are various programs um, that also allow Tor usage on Android. iOS is a little trickier because of Apple's lockdown um, on their devices. But there, is, there are various Tor browsers on the App Store. I personally use one called Onion Browser, um, which was written by Mike Tigas, who's a pretty well-known security um, researcher in the community, and so I trust that one personally. Uh, I think it's $1.99 on the App Store. Um, and then, secondly, the VPN question I was going to bring up and didn't. Uh, I actually don't use one right now, so I don't know of any good affordable options. Um, so if someone else in the audience does, that would be awesome because um, that's something I've been looking into as well. Give me two minutes and I'll tell you the name of mine. Sweet, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I should probably pay attention to who wants to look at mine. <laughs> um, personally, I used to use Astral to get online at work, but uh, uh, in terms of VPNs, but I also have a question about, like, I feel like a lot of companies prevent these privacy or these surveillance uh, practices not even as a choice. Like you join the company and de facto this is what's gonna happen. Like similarly, you're using Sprint and they have your data. You cannot use Sprint without them to collecting your data. Um, what, do you, do you foresee that changing in the future or do you think that you know, we'll have alternatives at some point? I hope so. Uh, I'm a little, I'm a bit of a pessimist by nature so um, I'm seeing the trend become more and more surveillance, and it's becoming more and more ubiquitous, and people are not really thinking about, like I've mentioned the fitness trackers thing, because I heard people around me at work going, oh, this is so cool, we're getting Fitbits for free, and this is great, yeah! And immediately I thought, but all your data, you're giving it all away, and you're not even thinking about it. And I think that's a position that we're in right now, is, Hopefully it's changing. I think privacy and surveillance is a conversation that's happening a lot more um, now. And I'm hopeful that by more people recognizing that it's an issue and hopefully bringing it up to their companies, we may see some change in that. 
All right, we're at time, I'm sorry. Um, but the VPN I use is called Private Internet Access, and I use iOS devices, and they, oh, after, oh, after the update about six months ago, you can very easily get VPN in through iOS, so. All right, now is clapping time.